Um, and, and these are plays that are still waiting to be produced. So hopefully we, maybe something will happen tonight where one of these will go off for full production. So um, I want to just say a couple of things that we haven't had a chance to do, and I'll make it really fast. But I have to say a couple of thank yous uh, as we close up tonight uh, to the, the staff here that made this possible because it's for a <laughs> Um, obviously, David Dower is a to the, the moderating mo rock star of the century. Ooh, We're so great. Yeah. 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 Jamie Galoon, who did so much organizing and is not here. She's in a show tonight, so uh, she's going to come later, I think, for a little partying, but she's not around. Uh, Aaron Washington, who is one of our fellows this year. Um, the Jay Matthew. <laughs> Matthew, who is all things uh, Twitter, uh, and uh, has really, um, really has such an incredible commitment to that third circle being a participant. So I'm so appreciative, the Jay, for what you've done. Um, and then I know I have one more in my head, but I want to make sure. Oh, let's see. I think I got everyone. Kevin Becerra. <laughs> Kevin's baby, he's our pr producing fellow, and he really did this from beginning to end, and it just stellar uh, producing job. So thank you, uh, Kevin. Really, really terrific. <laughs> um, and then uh, just sort of, you know, thanks to all of you. So um, the, the next thing I want to do uh, is introduce Jason King-Jones, who uh, put this uh, together and has directed these uh, little <laughs> things. And you're just going to introduce the actors. Yeah, great. Yep. great. Great. Hi, welcome, everybody. Um, and Jason is an intern with us uh, yes. in the institute uh, for, um, in, you know, through like April or something? Something or like May? that. Something like, like that, whatever. yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'm just here to introduce the actors and then we're going to get started. So um, when, when I call you, please stand up just so that we can recognize uh, Keith Irby and uh, Keishawn Wilson, uh, Steve Nixon, and uh, Young Sun Cho, and Vanessa Bradchulis. And then over here we have uh, Yasmin Toison and John Tweel, uh, Shante Tab, Akeem Davis, and Jana Valentiner. <laughs> Liz Engelman, uh, dramaturg extraordinaire, is here, and she's going to introduce the first play. Uh, Liz, are you up and ready for it? Thank you. <laughs> So I just want to introduce all of you to a little bit of Sherry Kramer's Bay of Fundy. I love Sherry Kramer. One of these, the, the thing I love about the theater too is sometimes you get to know a playwright through their work or sometimes you get to know a work through a playwright and I can't remember actually how this one happened, which I love <laughs> even more. Somehow both the playwright of Sherry and the play of Bay of Fundy kind of converged to me and I love them both. And that's I think what theater does is bring people together through work and um, bring work to two people um, as, a, as a vehicle. So this, the, you're going to see 10 minutes of this play. I'm not going to tell you too much about what goes on because you'll have to, you know, do it yourself somewhere and see it fully on stage. But I just want to say that um, one of the things I love about Sherry, I think also one of the challenges, is that she is um, a Shavian writer. <laughs> she uh, has Shavian wit. She has Shavian smarts. She writes uh, a lot about big ideas. And um, in this play, you're going to see um, both, you're, you'll feel that sense of language and her love of language and also the challenging theatricality of this play. Uh, a table expands to gigantic, humongous proportions and water overflows uh, ad nauseum through the play. And so it's, it's a challenge to stage and also it's very dense dialogue about um, big ideas, which just to give you a little snippet of what those big ideas are, it's really challenging the way that we see ourselves and our attachment to things and how can we reconsider um, our attachment to objects in this, um, in this world. So um, you'll get a taste. We can talk later if you have questions. But I just would put this out there because Sherry wanted me to say, she will cut for food. <laughs> <laughs> I love some. <laughs> I know I can always count on you, Hank. 
You've got a mythical hunger, too. <laughs> Did you know that Paul seduced me with a myth? Yes. How sweet. Which one? Prometheus. Right, right. Steals fire, gets chained to rock, has liver pecked out. <laughs> yeah, that's just what I said. I said fire, rock, liver. But it turns <laughs> out that in the oldest version, it's his heart. Oh. Really? Yes. Prometheus' heart is pecked out every day for years. And every day, it grows back. Just for stealing fire? Well, that's the strange thing, too. It turns out that fire is the very least of his crimes. It turns out that Paul, why don't you tell Nancy and Hank what the myth of Prometheus is really about? They don't want to hear about Prometheus, sugar. <laughs> well, all right, then. I'll tell them. <laughs> Hunger. Yes, not fire at all. Isn't that wild? Hunger. You see, in order to worship the gods, you had to sacrifice a whole oxen. And poor people couldn't afford to, so they couldn't be blessed by the gods. And because they couldn't be blessed by the gods, they couldn't have good fortune, and so they stayed poor people who were too hungry to sacrifice their oxen, and on and on. And that's where Prometheus comes in. He tricks the gods into being hungry, and he feeds the poor. And that's why they punish him. More fish, Hank. <laughs> Nancy, please have some more fish. You hardly had any. Really? I couldn't eat another bite. Mm. Our Nancy's got an appetite like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you like it? Oh, no, it's perfect. It's exactly how I like my fish. If I had made it myself, I could have made it more like I like it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, good. I got the recipe last time Paul and I went to Paris last month. Oh. What? <laughs> How could I forget the last time you went to Paris? They all ate. Nancy uses her napkin constantly to wipe up real or imagined drops of water or brush away crumbs, especially around Hank. She tends to caress the table, too. A little more than might be normal. <laughs> she likes to run her fingertips across its polished, gleaming surface and follow the contours of the pattern in the carved edge. Hank, oh, look, your, your glass is making a ring. Uh, May, I've been meaning to ask, uh, can you come tomorrow morning to help to the church and help us set up for the rummage sale? Of course. I'll pick you up at 8. I'm sure going to miss you next year. You always do such a good job. Miss me? Why? Well, when you move away. Nancy, we just put the house on the market. Yes, but just this week. In this climate, it could take a year or two. Or it sell. might sell right away if the right buyer comes along. <laughs> I think that's optimistic. Wildly optimistic. Don't you, Hank? Uh, uh, I don't know, May. Who knows? You might get a buyer right away. <laughs> and we might not. Some people are taking their houses off the market altogether. I wouldn't do that. You and Paul shouldn't do that. That would be a mistake. Oh, <laughs> Paul has no intention of doing that. <sighs> All right, eight it is. Good. This way I won't feel so badly about not working the actual sale next week. <laughs> what do you mean? I won't be able to run the jewelry booth this year. You always run the jewelry booth. May, please don't do this. We're going to the Bay of Fundy. We went years ago. We were so happy then. <laughs> so we're going back. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> No, you're doing the jewelry booth, like you did last year and at all the years but before. I just said. Yes, you will talk about the Bay of Fundy. You will make all these plans, and in two weeks, you'll have us over for dinner and cook something you'll tell us is a famous recipe from the Bay of Fundy, but you won't. <laughs> you won't go. Nancy, I really don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about the jewelry booth. You always run it, and so I don't know why. We just can't count on that instead of me begging someone to fill in for you. So they have to get a babysitter or change their gynecological appointment, and they upend their lives, and then, of course, you always show up, and it's humiliating because whoever I've begged to come is standing there, and here you come, and you push them out of I the way. I never push. You don't have to push. You push without pushing. You're so pretty 
and you haven't had a bit of work done, and everyone knows it, and, and, and if you're wearing a scarf, it just completes the outfit perfectly, instead of drawing attention to the fact that you're wearing a scarf, which is the way it always looks when I wear one. Nancy, what are you talking about? Your money. <laughs> your old, old money. Stop kicking me! Hey! <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to say it, but I am tired of not saying it. Everybody knows how old your money is. It's just so old, it's practically prehistoric. And that is what pushes Martha or Sissy or me out of the jewelry booth. But I don't want to be pushed around at the rummage sale this year. More fish, Nancy. I do not want more fish. What I want is for Mary, May, to stop lying about the Bay of Bundy. She's with friends. She doesn't have to. Hank, you look like you could do with seconds. Absolutely. <laughs> Paul passes the silver platter to Hank, who forks himself a whole fish, head and fin still attached, and puts it on his plate. <laughs> May, you know as well as I do that you aren't going to the Bay of Fundy. You know it, and I know it. Even Hank knows it. I'll I'll make a deal, okay? I'll pretend you're going everywhere else. You always pretend you're going. But just this once, could you not pretend? Please? I wish we could ask you along. <laughs> but you know how Paul is. He likes his privacy on the road. More fish? Have some fish, dear, okay? I don't want more fish! <laughs> That's our man, always eating like a bird. What I want is for Mary May to see to say she's going to do the jewelry booth. What I want. Are you hungry for some chicken or steak or something other than fish? I'll tell you what I'm hungry for, May. I'm hungry for an honest answer. I'm hungry. Nancy, if my little bird is so hungry all of a sudden, maybe she should eat some fish. All right. All right, I'll have another piece. Hank passes Nancy the platter. She spears a huge fish with the fork. <laughs> Oh, good. I, I'm glad you like it. Of course I like it! It's my recipe! I gave it to you last year after you came over to our house and liked it so much you asked me for it. No, you're mistaken. The last time Paul and I went to Paris... May! This is my recipe. Almost all of the recipes you say you get on your travels are mine. Of course, there's some truth in that, because next door to our house is just about as far as you've ever traveled. You didn't go to France last year, or Bhutan the year before, or even San Francisco in the fall. You have not set foot outside a 25-mile radius since I've known you. It's not a secret, May. Everybody knows it. I'm sick of you thinking we're not good enough for you to share your secrets with when they're not even secrets. <laughs> and I am really sick of hearing about recipes that you got when you went but really didn't go to France. And in her <laughs> anger, she slams the heavy two-pronged serving fork with a thick handle down on the table near the edge. The edge of the table splinters and it breaks off. <laughs> oh my god. Paul. Paul. What has happened? Oh my god. Jesus Christ. Hank. Hank. I it, is, it is big, almost a foot long, eight inches wide. <laughs> it was an accident, Hank! Hank takes the chunk from her and hands it to Paul. Paul hands it to me. <laughs> oh, no, no. How many times have I told you, Nancy? It's see? not my fault. Maybe, maybe there was a crap that was already there. I mean, I, I was just eating dinner like I always do. It was an accident. Oh, my. Oh, my. Jesus oh my. H. Christ. It's not my fault. Already, the seashell-cut crystal bowl are beginning to melt. <laughs> May say something. May, forgive me. May! It's not my fault, but uh, maybe it is. This is my place at the table, but have my plates been too heavy? The, the food piled too high? Talk to me, May. May! Say something! It's... It's just a little scratch. It can be fixed. It's nothing. It can be it can be fixed. It's it's all right. How can it be all right? It's the end of the world. Of course it isn't. It's just a table. No, it's not. 
Well, Nancy, if May says it can be fixed... She's just saying that because it's the polite thing to say. May, tell Nancy again. Tell her it can be fixed. Tell her. Stop it! I know what I've done. One of those men from Sotheby's or Christie's who are always drifting in, rooting around, trying to buy it from you, one of them told me... I told you not to talk to them, sweetheart. I know, but they're so insistent! Even though I make it very clear that May has no intention of selling the table, they still ask if I can sneak them in to look at it, and, and their eyes get glazed. Uh, the way a, a man's eyes get glazed over to just, yeah, yeah, yes, that kind of glaze, and, and I wanted to know, Hank, I wanted to know. So I, I told one of them that I'd sneak him in if he'd tell me how much it was worth. Why didn't you just ask me? I would have told you. No, you wouldn't have. So, one day when you were in the garden, I, I brought him in through the side door, and he looked at it, and his eyes glazed over, and, and he started to breathe really hard through his nose, and then he got very quiet, and he told me, it took my breath away. In my wildest dreams, I never imagined, I, I couldn't imagine, what he told me. May runs her fingers lovingly along the edge of the table as she walks around it. It's one of a pair of tables made in 1835 from a single tree, the most perfect mahogany tree ever found in the Amazon, a tree with a name, the Red Mother, named because this tree was the central feature in a village of a tribe of Peruvian natives who were all cut down in the raid that preceded the cutting down of this tree. The Red Mother called this for her characteristic but exemplary red hue, was sent to America where she was made into two matching tables, each with 12 chairs, and two matching sideboards, two matching break fronts, two small carving tables, and two tea carts, all from this one perfect tree. These two perfect dining room sets were packed and placed on, a bo on board a ship sailing for Liverpool in 1838, a special order for Lord Harrington, who had two daughters of marriageable age, both of whom had expressed the desire for New World mahogany, no matter what the cost. The ship sank in a storm less than four days out. All hands were lost, naturally, all cargo as well. Three days later, against all odds, one of the two tables was found standing upright on its legs without a nick or scratch or blemish on a beach near Plymouth, washed ashore by the full moon tide. It was found by a young man who, taking advantage of the laws of salvage, carted it away and from its sale began one of the most lucrative furniture businesses of his day. It changed hands only twice and belonged to the Gordons of Philadelphia for over a hundred years until Mrs. Mariah Gordon decided to punish her husband for his latest and most humiliating indiscretion. She demanded the table in the divorce settlement and then immediately donated it to an auction for a local charity. A young professor's wife, volunteering at the auction, was seized by an uncontrollable hunger to be someone who sat down to dinner every night at a table that was perhaps the most important and valuable table in the world. When the bidding began, she left the small area where she was offering coffee and pedophores, and in a matter of minutes, and to the amazement of those assembled, the table was hers. And now I've ruined it. <laughs> Stop saying that, Nancy. It can be fixed. I watch Antiques Roadshow! <laughs> I know what happens when you repair something. There goes the value up in a puff of smoke. This was a table that could swim. <laughs> that could save itself, that, that could make it upright to shore. The 
American miracle, that's what he called it, and I've destroyed it. Would anyone like some more fish? End of scene. <laughs> Alana Brownstein, who can do more, make more meaning with 140 characters than any other Twitter, uh, any other tweeter I know. So if you want to introduce uh, sure. Alana uh, Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alana Brownstein, and I am here to advocate for Etymology of Bird by Zakia Alexander. Right on. Which is an amazing, amazing play that has had a production. <laughs> um, a while ago. And um, uh, this is a play that I, as Polly stipulated, bled for, uh, rooted for, and uh, got said no to. And it's a play that also I think my advocacy for it in a lot of ways um, set the stage for a deep rift between me and the people I was working with because they couldn't understand why I liked it so much. Um, so. I put myself on the line for it once, I'll do it again. Here I am. Uh, I, and uh, as part of this, I know I only have three minutes, but I'm gonna use all of the three minutes, because um, I have more than 140 characters to say. Uh, I read you this from Zakia, the playwright. She says, this play came about because I became obsessed with the relationship between the cops and the often black and Latino communities. There is a repeated violence. Another kid gets shot, the cop gets off, and it's baffling. The tension between the community and cops is always so hot, and rarely do we get to the bottom of it, the fear, the lack of mutual respect, so the cycle just repeats. But on a larger level, I was also interested in exploring a love story between neighborhood kids who are innocent, even though they might not look it from the outside. I have never seen a believable love story told from the point of view of kids who looked like me and the kids I knew growing up, and I don't mean the cliched, violent kids from the hood. I mean the kids with families, support, who may not always have economic stability. I wanted to tell the story in a structurally surprising way, so the first act, Jermaine is the protagonist, but in the second act, it's Birdie, and it's about what happens after first love, first heartbreak, first tragedy, and the community around that. It's about growing up. And I will just finish by saying that Zakia is one of our great playwrights who has gone away to TV. She writes for Grey's Anatomy, and she's great at it. But I think you, you, you should produce this play and bring one of our great playwrights back to the theater. The Etymology of Bird by Zakia Alexander. Time, now, unless now changes. Place, bed -Stuy, Brooklyn. Four, Timothy Stansbury Jr. and all the innocents who never even saw it coming. Germain, in the light of dawn, city noise blends like a beat. Okay. Got dreams inside, they be looking for light. Lyrics sweat when you hotter than pop the other tight. My success is God giving us on the proof of birthright, huh? Uh, okay, better listen, cause yo, my words is honest. Streets blessed me with the dopest symphonics. Man child, in a land without a promise. But, but, but mama raised me knowing how to fight, and I'ma have you feeling the spirit like you the Semite. My rhymes is lightning, blowing all kinds of destruction. I ain't the kind of man who's gonna swallow reduction. More troops to spit than you could possibly know. Just wait a bit. And I'm a bloke, huh? Okay, okay. My horn got much more flow than Jericho. I know you be thinking he ain't gonna make it. The tractors don't know I can dish it and take it. This life was a gift and I'm not trying to waste it. I know they be thinking that I ain't gonna make it. But they ain't seen me yet. Burst of light, far too bright to look directly at. Birdie sits on a third floor fire escape. Books are scattered around her. Closing her eyes, she's attempting to remember. Transgressive, an easy one. Trans means across, gresses to step. So transgressive is somebody who crosses over something. No, no, it's somebody who goes against the rules or the law. Also means sinner, Breaking the law or sinning, <sighs> stay in my brain. 
Transgressor. 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 Pop sticks his head out the window. Ooh. <laughs> Hotter than an oven out here. And it's only July. All went along, you can't be complaining that it's cold. Immediately <laughs> moving to Florida. <laughs> you and all him old people. I am old, Bertie. <laughs> You're not. Can't raise a finger without breaking a sweat. And you actually sitting out here studying? You've always been a cold-blooded child, <laughs> just like your mother. I got five more pages of vocabulary and a practice test. The sun seems like it's never going down. A night like this reminds me. Of what? Everything you're too young to know. <laughs> That's how come I know I'm old. <laughs> Ice cream. Pistachio? Cardio, the doctor keeps saying. <laughs> know what that fool said? He's gonna tell me to walk around the mall. <laughs> Told him you must not have ever been to Flatbush before. <laughs> Folks don't walk, they run. <laughs> he also said you were supposed to watch your sugar. You can have some fruit, some pineapple. That's some... how they try and kill you. <laughs> Keep you away from all the little things that make you happy. <laughs> Tell me one. Voxiparate. How's it spelled? V O C I F E R A T E. Isn't that something? <laughs> that let us fit together and make a word that never touched my ear before. You have to think about how it sounds. This is an easy one. Vociferate. Sounds like voice, right? Right. Vox means voice, yeah. Does it mean talking? Like right now, we're vociferating? <laughs> <laughs> Close pop. I give you a clue. Ferry, it means carry. For the life of me, I can't figure it. It means to cry out with a loud voice. It's a puzzle. Just gotta put the pieces together. <laughs> Them Latins was something else. <laughs> How they just move letters around and bingo, you got yourself a meaning. <laughs> I'll never know. I'm going. Don't smoke a cigar on your way there either. Birdie, you are not my wife. Doctor said you're supposed to do. Look at your books and stop telling me what to do. One pistachio in a cup with extra, extra nuts. nuts. <laughs> Pop exits. Expurgate. X means, um, it means out, like exit, right? And purgate, that's like growing up, like purging, like. Okay. So I, expurgate. I, I got, I, I got, hey, I got dreams. They, they be looking for light. I got dreams inside. They be looking for light. Your name. So bird. How come you gotta play that so loud that the whole building can hear you? Why don't you go inside? Huh? You don't even live here. And it was fine till you came out. Can you turn that down, please? Some of us got shit to do. Oh, hey. Now look at you using those four-letter words. Huh? Fuck you, Jermaine. Damn. Damn. Why well, everybody gotta have a problem with me today? Subway car, some asshole in a suit, staring at my headphones, but don't say nothing. People shaking their heads and rolling their eyes, looking at me like I'm stupid. All they wanted was for you to turn down your music. Well, they don't like it. They could move. It's a free country. I took a step closer to that armpit stain having motherfucker and <laughs> blasted my shit up as high as high as it could go. Nodding my head to the beat, like what? <laughs> That's why your ass always in trouble. She so doing homework? I'm studying. Don't tell me they put Brainiac Bird in summer school? SATs. Bird, school's out Friday. We's free. 
We've been emancipated like the slaves. <laughs> Thank God Almighty, we spread. I got a lot of work to catch up on. You going to the graduation party on Saturday? Who's? Mine. And Doey's. Doey didn't graduate. <laughs> Who cares if we don't walk till summer? It still counts. You coming? I don't know. Well, you just going to study every day, all night long. It's not even like the party's going to be that good. What? Sooner or later, there's going to be a fight, and then the cops going to be breaking it up. Same old shit, different night. You ought to be happy for me. Hmm. Who would have thought my ass would be graduating? And when I was tutoring you, things didn't look so good. Mm. But I did it. Passed. Barely. But you did it. You're really not going to come, Bird. What time is it? Uh, it starts probably... Cash early. and Joey enter with greasy paper bags. Y'all try calling your ass, man. How come you never pick up? Cuz, I know it's you, son. Mm -hmm. Man, that's cold. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Birdie? Nothing. Want a wing? Uh, how come? We gonna go all the way to the Chinese joint on Fulton, right? Right. You know the good one where they give you all the sauces and, and, the, and, the, and the two fortunes? Why don't we walk all the way there in this kind of heat? Like the black, make a black nigga black heat? And what do he order? Chicken wings and fries. No kind of rice. No kind of Chinese food. Chicken and fries. You too kettle, son. I like the way they make it. Not too greasy. Plenty of hot sauce. How you doing, Bertie? Hey, why don't you come down here and let me out at you? I'm busy. Uh, well, let's be out. I got the bootlegger that new Kung Fu joint in my place. Yo, did you see the commercial? Why'd that nigga do a kick like, hi -ya! <laughs> I'm gonna learn Kung Fu and be just as fly as that. Then I'm gonna sweep Birdie off your feet. How'd you like that, Birdie? Birdie! What? How she think she's playing somebody? Think about something. <laughs> I will. You promise? Promise. Expurgate means um, to purify from anything noxious. Expurgate. 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 Remember, remember. Remember. End of scene. real and unreal all at once. Suzanne and Monica is Speed the Plow as written by UNESCO. I love it dearly. <laughs> the Further Adventures of Suzanne and Monica by Alex Lewin. Scene one, a private screening room. Lights are up, nothing is on the screen. Suzanne has just come in. Monica is here, sitting and reading Adventures in the Screen Trade. <laughs> you know what I was just thinking about? I was sitting here, and I was thinking, you know what, I'm sorry, I cannot make it through this book. <laughs> I was thinking about fathers and sons, 
and about how it's a father's instinct to encourage his son to get laid, to pat him on the back, applaud his efforts, great job, son, you got some pussy. <laughs> but when it comes to their daughters, fathers don't want them getting anywhere near a penis. And it's like, what? I'm not allowed to be a sexual being, to be predatory, or even, you know, just horny, or curious, <laughs> just sentient and sexual, right? And do we get that encouragement from our mothers? Do mothers like <gasps> hang out with their daughters after prom night and go, good job, sweetie, you got some dick. Oh. <laughs> Sex ennobles men and it damages women. Why is that? Or, you know what else? Black people in movies. Why are they like sexual beasts? I mean it. You look. When a black man kisses a black woman, it isn't dainty or sensual or even romantic. No, it is atavistic, primitive, all slobber and panting, tongues attacking. The fetishization of African Americans. And why is it you've been around? You tell me. Why is it that in an industry run by Jews and homosexuals, Nobody dares make movies about Jews or homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed? Also, Jewish actors are only ever hired to play Italians. <laughs> so, you work your fucking ass off, right? To get into the entertainment business, and you say to yourself, all right, this is the way it is, and I'm not getting down on Hollywood. And this is how people consume art interact with art, or what passes for art. And yes, that art reinforces stereotypes. But it isn't always damaging, you know? Because here's what my mom told me. Men seduce, but women? Women put themselves in a position to be seduced. <laughs> you think that's true? I have to say, I think that's largely true. But it warped me. I won't get into how. We can get into how it warped me some other time. But it did. It fucked me up for a little while, having that foundation to start from. But we play the cliches of ourselves all the time, don't we? Men still sit around and watch football while women do the cooking. And we are progressive people. It's not like we long for the days of, I don't know, father knows best or whatever. We're not trash. We're sophisticates. But we let men have the stage they crave so desperately because what's the use in fighting them? You know? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If that's okay with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Who are you? <laughs> I'm Monica Grant. Monica, didn't they tell you I was coming? Nobody tells me anything anymore. Oh, well, I'm here. And you are? Monica. <laughs> Monica Grant. You must be my new sponsor. Sponsor for what? I scared the last one off, you know. She had a new baby. <laughs> I told her it was uglier than rotten fruit. <laughs> but if she shouldn't worry, it wouldn't live. <laughs> Sponsor? For what? Forget it. Would you mind waiting outside? Only the producers and the director and I are allowed to watch the dailies. We watched them already. The footage looks pretty good. I think they're concerned about how much you're blinking. Someone will talk to you about it. Good. Who are you? I'm your double. You. Me? You. Aha. Uh -huh. So. Delighted to make your acquaintance. You're sweet. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How was your day? Pardon me. How'd it go today? Fine. I worked. I did my work. What are you going to do now? It was. Monica! Monica Grant. Thank you for saying hi, Monica. Mm -hmm. Good night. Mm. You want beer? Damn little girl, aren't you? Why? You know, 
I used to avoid beer until it became cool to be a little, uh, you know, chunky. <laughs> Natural, as they say. I hope it lasts. I like beer. And combos, you know, those little pretzel things with the processed cheese and stuff? <laughs> I could eat a whole room full of them. But I'm committed to my work, Suzanne. I'm a serious artist. Aren't you going to have one with me? Oh! Your sponsor. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> right. So, um, tomorrow? Right. I'll be standing in for you. 5.30 a.m. Great. Yeah. Have you done this before? This is my first gig, not counting student films. I went to Yale, you know. Casting office find you. Uh, no, Mr. Weber hired me. Mr. Weber? Yeah. William Weber. Yeah. I didn't know studio heads were in the business of casting standards. I'm also your stunt double. For what? The fight scene? I guess. I haven't actually read the script. I didn't ask for a standard. I know. They offered, and I said, no, I'm a pro, I'm not one of those, I, I mean, I don't stay in my trailer until it's time for the take. I do a job. Yeah, but they brought you in anyway. I'm also your stunt You said that already. There's this thing that happens with women. I made a study of it. They get nominated for Academy Awards four or five times in the space of like six or eight years. Glenn Close, for instance, or Jane Alexander, Martha Mason, Julianne Moore. And what happens? They never win. And then the chances disappear. There is a prime. I'm sorry, but there is. And if you're going to be in this business, I'm not saying you have to surrender to it. But you do have to know it and accept it. I'm sorry, but you have to. And a prime for women. <coughs> yes? I'm your breast double. <laughs> <laughs> Show me. I'm sorry? Why? Did you fart? <laughs> well, did you? No, I did not <coughs> fart. What you just did? That's something I never do. I'm sorry? No, you did nothing wrong. You don't apologize. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what you're asking of me. Show me your breasts. <laughs> I want to see the pair of breasts. They're intended to pass for mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, do it! Excuse me? Excuse me, I don't just whip them out for anybody just to see it. And for how many men did you whip them out in order to get this job? I wait tables, for Christ's sake. So did I, for ten years. <laughs> and I'll thank you not to take the Lord's name in vain. Are you serious? <laughs> Sure. Sorry. Listen. We all subject ourselves to... We all make subject of ourselves. <laughs> Don't you sell your body? And worse, your mind? Golly, you're right. I think I'll go back to Columbus and open a coffee shop. Please don't patronize me. This is so uncalled for. You know what's so special about this movie? The nude scene is actually a good scene. When you make time to read the script, you'll see. And now here I am, fighting for the privilege to show my apparently too saggy breasts for the world. I'm sure it's not about the sag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's about... About what? Roundness? Suzanne. Rotundity? Listen, Perk! <laughs> There's no need to be angry at me, Suzanne. Try Ms. Baxter. <laughs> How old are you, sweetie? I'm 22, and you're comfortable strutting your career this way. 60 years from now, if somebody wants to write in my biography that I did this thing when I was right out of college, so what? The nude scene is the reason I pursued this project. I know. Of course you know. Because Billy Weber knows, and they know I never would have done the movie if I had known that they were going to pull this kind of son of a bitch! Allow me to share with you a, a truism, my winsome ingenue. Men 
in this business. We'll treat you like the commodity that you are. Fine. <laughs> Everyone knows that it's as old as Hollywood. But the real hard truth, you'll be treated twice as badly by women. Mm -hmm. When we see each other tomorrow night, I want you to ask me how my day was because I will have spent it half naked, surrounded by several dozen men who pretended not to look. Of course I've read the script, and it is a good scene. And that is nothing at all, nothing whatsoever to do with me. If you're selling your body, I'm renting mine. Mm -hmm. I'll give you $50,000 to not show up tomorrow. Please, Monica, just disappear. I'll explain everything to Billy when the shoot is over. Nobody will blame you. You won't be blackballed. What would it take to disappear? <laughs> what would it take to disappear? Thanks for the beer. I'll just, yeah. See you soon. End of scene. <laughs>
Mention a thing that is white. The guide says, a swan. It is perfect white, and it has a long bent neck. A bent neck, how is that? The guide, bending his arm into the shape of a swan's neck, moves the blind man's hand along his arm. The blind man exclaims, now I know how looks milk. <laughs> Part one, daybreak. <coughs> A boy sits at the piano. A woman runs a vacuum cleaner across the stage. The woman moves off stage. The boy finishes the praise. Margaret and Herman in an alley. They have met, taking out their trash. I've been, been, well, this is going to sound appalling, but reading about music. <laughs> you told me to read Schoenberg's letters. I did? You did? That's incredible. No, it's because I asked you if there was something I could read about music. Yes, yes, it's just, you know, most people you tell them to go get Schoenberg's letters and read them. <laughs> they don't just go out and do it. Well, you said there's so much there. <laughs> yes. And I don't, well, not that I've actually, you know, listened to Schoenberg's, his music. No? Actually, I haven't listened to really anything in, well, years. I've been, well, afraid to listen. I'm sure I sound like a lunatic. No. I myself am afraid. Often of, well, even leaving the apartment. Oh. I mean, I, I do it. <laughs> yes. But it can be, well, absolutely terrifying. Yes. Sometimes associations, difficult loss, that kind of thing, and, and it takes a while to um, find your way back, or, or you don't want to go back or can't, but to move ahead, that too can be a conundrum. Yes. So actually, listening, you know, to music, well, initially, uh, that might be too hard. Uh -huh. But reading about it, <laughs> well, that might be the thing to do. <laughs> and do you ever, do you ever, find it, well, impossible, in spite of your firm declaration, your firm stance to not, impossible to keep from going to the notes in your head. Yes. Though I myself never found it necessary to make such a declaration, hmm. to not listen. But I can't imagine the need to do that. And, for instance, I, I just can't have the radio on when I'm, this, when I'm having supper with a friend. You know, music under conversation. Well, that's impossible for me. Yes. Is this recycling? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, it's quite all right. It's a condition. They can't not hear it in their head. Yes. I don't remember this to have been the case with me. I mean, the 
condition. Oh, well, maybe it was. You should come to the library. You can listen there. Second floor. Thank you. Anyway, Schoenberg, his letters, when you mentioned them, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, way back, in, I thought, maybe because I imagined that he would be impenetrable in some way, aloof, and that would be helpful, reassuring. But he was incredibly... Yes, so human and funny and passionate, but still somehow so comforting. His complete lack of interest in me. <laughs> and what people want, and what they expect, is such a relief. When he writes about music, what it is, how you can't pin it down. Yes. <laughs> Ineffable. Yes. <laughs> Night. A bed with an open window above it lies on stage. Margaret lies in the bed, listening to the sounds of the night. End of scene.